people and extra soap travel size soap bars and laundry soap cleaning soap flakes i've been using that stuff all day long today great stuff order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call 218-568-2525 218-568-2525 pure soap flake company is a proud member of the handcrafted soap and cosmetic guild it's the opperman report and now here is investigator ed opperman Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. Show is brought to you by kmdlaw.com. Let's see here. There was something here. I heard from that woman who was, uh, she dated Woody Allen when she was like 15 years old, and then she worked for Robert Evans, or she was friends with Robert Evans, and then she worked for uh, uh, um, Jeffrey Epstein. You know, she she didn't. She said she didn't see anything uh, hinky about the. Uh, oh, that nut. Let me see if I could find. I forget her name here. I'm looking for it now. She sent me like a little holiday greeting. <laughs> you know, you gotta wonder, man. You know. Hey, let's see. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm fine. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Because I'm gonna talk about Buck Henry, and the uh, oh Christina. Engelhart, okay? She went by her name, Baby Christina, by the way. She dated Woody Allen. She's the uh, character in the movie um, uh, Manhattan, the Mariel Hemingway character. She worked for Epstein as an assistant. She was friends and worked with uh, Fellini, Federico Fellini, and Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda, Okay? And also Robert Evans. And you might go back and, and see we had that uh, interview with Mark Ebner where uh, we had the recording of uh, Robert Evans ordering a 16-year-old uh, child from uh, Heidi Fleiss. Okay. Now, why do I bring all this up? Buck Henry. Buck Henry, uh, comedian, filmmaker, writer, wrote uh, The Graduate wrote Catch-22, a lot of stuff, man. A frequent guest on Saturday Night Live when the series was actually decent and funny, okay? Now, just off the top of my head, just my memory of uh, what went on there at Saturday Night Live, there was a period of time where this woman named Jean Dominion D-O-U-M-A-N-I-A-N. Now, she was an interesting character because she was involved with Woody Allen. She produced a lot of his stuff, and I'd, some people even say they had some kind of relationship. I don't know. Okay. But she became the producer, director of SNL. She replaced Lorne Michaels during that period of time when Lorne Michaels uh, uh, was absent from the running that show. She was heavily involved with Woody Allen. And I, I read some stuff once I'm whole expose about this situation. And they said that during this period of time when the show really sucked, Woody Allen, she was back and forth, you know, producing and directing the show. Running, Woody Allen was involved with Saturday Night Live, you know, not getting paid, not getting credit, but he was, you know, providing content for that show, writing and influencing, inspiring. He had a lot of influence over the content there during the her reign. And I also remember that during this period of time, she also was all hooked in with this guy, Michael O'Donoghue, okay, who was on Saturday Night Live as well. Really dark guy, you know, dark humor, they call it. And the allegation was, in this article, was that they were somehow involved in some kind of Satanism, okay? That they were, like, you know, hanging out with people involved with Satanism. Now... I believe this is the same period of time that Buck Henry was doing those uh, uh, skits on there about the uncle, you know, who would come and babysit for the two little girls and they would stick their hands down in his pockets and do all this kind of perverted stuff. Now, there's these, these routines about pedophilia on Saturday Night Live. It's a big joke. And it was another scene with Michael O'Donny where he's reading a bedtime story to a 14-year-old Jodie Foster who's in a baby doll nightgown sitting on his lap, getting read a bedtime story by this perverted Satanist, Michael O'Donoghue. 
So I got to tell you, you know, although I, I think Buck Henry had some talent, what's the influence going on here with this guy, you know? And someone needs to take a look at that and uh, see what's going on there. Now, Buck Henry also co-wrote, he created what? Get Smart. Along with Mel uh, Brooks. All right? And Mel Brooks is also associated with the Rob Reiner. Some people say Rob Reiner was there at Altamont. You know, you hear that story. Who knows if that's true or not? I don't know. But you hear the story, you know. Now, Get Smart. Who was the villain in Get Smart? It was a group called Chaos. Right? Now, you had uh, Control was like a, seemed to be some type of American government sponsored spy organization. But Chaos was not state sponsored. It was kind of a loosely affiliated kind of a cult group that wanted chaos. For some reason, they wanted chaos and confusion and anarchy and destruction around the world. They were evil. It doesn't say they're Satanists or anything like that, but they were like an evil group. And you got to wonder, you know, ooh, uh, you know, <laughs> What, what, who wanted chaos, too? Who wanted chaos? Whose goal was chaos? The process church of the final judgment. According to the theory that the reason why they, they uh, conducted those Son of Sam murders is they wanted chaos and, and, uh, and confusion and anarchy, and they wanted fear. They wanted to cause those kind of problems. And it, it's the same motive, allegedly, it would cause the, the Atlanta child murders. And all these other things. And, and what did Charles Manson want? He was influenced by the Protestant church. And he wanted a race war between the blacks and whites and that he could come up and take control. Right? That's the theory, these theories, these reoccurring theories of chaos. And if you look at the movie, it was a remake of the movie Dragnet starring Dan Aykroyd. Again, a Saturday Night Live alumni. And there was a group that called, I think it was called the Pagans in that group. And there's even a character in that group based on uh, Larry Flint. <clears throat> and or Hugh Hefner. And we know they're kind of, you know, the Larry Flint's connection to the process, of, to the Roy, Roy Raiden murder, you know, his bodyguard was Bill Menzer. And that was a group they, again, called the Pagans that were evil. They were more satanic than, than this other chaos from the uh, uh, Get Smart. But it's that same kind of thing, that this wild group, you know, just motivated by causing chaos. You know what I'm saying? So I, I really think there's something to all that, you know, and uh, one of those things where they're just kind of sticking stuff in your face. That's my little two cents on that. Hey, now, I have one other weird thing to add to you, you know, because we've had this whole situation this week with the Iran and Trump killing this Iranian general and claiming that uh, they were plotting to bomb an embassy, you know, that's chaos. <laughs> that's chaos in our government, you know? And then Iran shoots down a civilian plane and it's full of little kids and people going to a wedding. It's just oh, horrific uh, situation there, you know? And one thing that strikes me out of all this, and maybe the average person doesn't notice this or what, and I don't know, but when we talk about the assassination of this Iranian general, they like to say, we took him out, you know? Like even the average citizen who's never been involved in organized crime or, or intelligence assassinations, because that's lingo, you know? That's like intelligence lingo or organized crime, and we took him out. You know, why does the average person use a phrase like that that's so detached from a murder, you know? And, and and that murder was the, the catalyst for this death of this whole plane, 180 innocent people on a plane going to a wedding. And, you know, life on, 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 on this earth is so short, you know, and, and how we could be motivated by um, war and greed and killing each other. And uh, all of these perversions and, and even, you know, locking up people in jails and, you know, you have one life to live and you're locking people up for these minor offenses and stuff and ruining their lives. They did a whole show about the mass incarceration, people dying in prison for lack of medical care. 
We're going to be playing it shortly. And I even, I was even, uh, I had to go to DMV a couple of times this month. You know, and you got to go there and sit there for three hours. Take three hours out of your life to sit there. You know, life is so precious. And we, we've we designed, we've created a system where we have to take time out of our life to go there and wait online. Why? Just so they can charge us for a registration and a license. and blah, 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 blah. You know? What are we doing? What are we doing? You know, and I, someone played for me. Oh, you know, it was my my friend Christine's dad in Puerto Rico, in Vieques, the island of Vieques. And she went by this farm out there. And I got all these little goats, you know, and sheep, you know, dancing around, playing with each other. And there's a bunch of pigs uh, in, in the group, too, you know. How can you look at these? And they're running around there playing with each other and dancing and jumping up on things and stuff like that. How can you look at that? You know, these happy little pigs. They're like dogs and cats. They're like little monkeys and little pets. You know? Living their life, you know? They don't know that they're living their life to be slaughtered and eaten. Right? Just like you and me. We're being living our life to be slaughtered and you know, leached off of. You know, that our labor is taken from us, our... You know, our time is taken from us that we have to go sit there like a bunch of uh, cows in a in a cattle, uh, uh, you know, shoot, you know, on, on the way to our slaughter. We got to in the DMV so we can go there and they can bleed us for our money. This whole business. Buy a car. Why does the car have to be registered? Just buy a car, man. You don't even want to drive it. Insurance, all this crap you got to pay for. It's nonsense. Life is short life is short okay on this planet the time we have here with each other we should treat each other with respect and love not uh, lying to each other and, and, and ripping each other off and this kind of stuff stalking people you know I had, I had three people come in stalking cases even uh, uh bobby brown is you know which, oh yeah she's being stalked you know and you're in a public eye, you get stalked by these crazy people. The other one, too, the, the woman with the bees. <laughs> She's being stalked. You know? So, I uh, told you the story before in the past about my friend Joe. This kid used to install the car phones for me when I had the beeper company back on Staten Island. He used to sell beepers and cell phones. And back then, it was car phones. A young man comes to me. And uh, he says, hey, you know, I work for this other company, installing phones. I want to install phones for you. I didn't even do car phones at the time. I wasn't doing installation. I didn't have a guy to install for me. I had Joe, and he went out there, and he would go to the guy's house and install the phone for him. Program the phones for him. He knew all about this stuff. And me and him became really good friends. We started hanging out together. He was about 10 years younger than me. And, you know, we used to go out and drink and stuff like that and you know, look for women <laughs> and go to clubs and stuff like that, trying to pick up women, you know. As a matter of fact, oh, I was telling my daughter this story about that because he had a girlfriend and he met this girl that I liked and I, and I, started, and I started dating the girl that he liked. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's all fair because he had a girlfriend. This is, you know, you know I, stole it. I stole this girl from him, but, you know, but we always got along good. And he's the guy I tell you about who his father worked for Michael Jackson. On that, I think it was the Thriller Tour, the one that was uh, produced by um, uh, Al Sharpton and Michael Francis, the mafia guy, who ratted out his own father, by the way, then became a born-again Christian, and then got arrested again for more crimes. Anyway, and we all know what happened to Al Sharpton. Went to work for the FBI. But he told me, uh, we were hanging around talking one day, we were talking about Al Sharpton, and he says, oh, Ed, man, stay away from that guy. Al Sharpton's a bad guy. I said, well, why, why is that? He said, well, Michael Jackson got caught molesting little kids, and it was all covered up. And I said, well, let's go to the National Enquirer. Let's tell the story. This, by the way, this is years before Jordy Chandler. This was years before the first public case about uh, Michael Jackson molesting anybody. And I said, why? Well, I always knew the story was true. And now we know more because what do we have? We have Paul Baresi and uh, um, Dan O'Hanks. Both were PIs working for Michael Jackson for his defense team, and they both came on the show and said he's guilty. They worked the case. They say it. We're going to have a debate about this? <laughs> the defense team says he's guilty? Okay, we're going to still debate this? Anyway.